um, it's great, uh, great to join you. Uh, great to join you. I'm sorry, only remotely, but I hope it works. And I would like to give you a brief presentation on what fascinates me, and that is evolution, and also to think about how evolution works together with Christianity. And uh, maybe we can also have some uh, discussion afterwards. So I'm trying to share the screen now, so you can see my presentation. And I hope this works. Can you see the slides? Very good. So first slide, God and evolution. And this is the topic of my talk, God and evolution. And here is um, a slide uh, that I use to start almost every class uh, that I give every year in Harvard. This is the first slide that I show to the students. Here are a few dates that are truly remarkable and truly important. And this is um, when it all happened. So you can ask the physicists, when did the universe come into existence? And the answer is 13.7 billion years ago, the so-called Big Bang. You can also ask, when did our own solar system come into existence? And again, the answer that physicists give is precise, 4.567 billion years is when our sun was born. Soon afterwards, Earth came into existence and soon afterwards, moon. Then we go into the biological dates. So the question is, when was the origin of life on Earth? And this we do not know uh, for sure, but most people place it at around 4 billion years. The first date that is sort of coming with some certainty is actually bacterial life. By 3.5 billion years, bacteria were alive on Earth as they are alive now. And then um, it took a and the so-called carrier are the higher cells, they came into existence 1.8 billion years ago. And complex multicellularity arose 600 million years ago. So only 600 million years ago, for the first time, you actually have structures on Earth that you could see without a microscope. So you could see life uh, with, uh, without the aid of a microscope only from about 600 million years ago. Then you can ask evolutionary, what is the most relevant thing that happened in the last 600 million years? And really by far the most relevant step is the emergence of human language approximately a million years ago, uh, because human language gives rise to a new mode of evolution, not just genetic evolution, but now also cultural evolution. And this really makes us totally different to all the other animals on Earth. Then evolution is the theory that grows the tree of life. And broadly speaking, this tree has three very, very big branches. On one bacteria, then archaea, they are also simple cells, and then the eukaryotes. At the very tip of the eukaryote branch, you see animals. And in this tip would be the tree that also leads to humans. So if we are asked to believe that evolution gives rise to all of this, we, we have to ask the question, what is evolution? And uh, before we answer the question, what is evolution, we ask the question, what is it that evolves? And this was precisely explained by the evolutionary biologist Ernst Mayer, for example, uh, who said that the carrier of the evolutionary process are populations. So the one thing that evolves are populations of reproducing individuals, and they can be cells, or animals or plants, but populations carry the evolutionary process. Then mutation means that after some time there is a new type emerging in a population. So something has changed now, for example, the genome has changed or a new idea has emerged and we would describe this as a mutation. And then selection, natural selection means that over time one type grows faster than another type and this is natural selection. And for a long time, mutation and selection were considered to be the only ingredients of the evolutionary process. And this is kind of a bleak view because natural selection, of course, is competition. And this is a fierce fight, everybody against everybody else. But in the last few decades, people have realized that selection is not the only aspect of evolution. There's something else that is truly important, that this is cooperation. And cooperation means that individuals not only fight against each other, they not only compete, but they could also help each other. They could uh, work together. 
And what we realize is that cooperation is a kind of master architect of the evolutionary process. So cooperation means there's a donor, the donor pays a cost, and the recipient gets a benefit. So we can think of a human person helping another human person. Or we can think a cell that releases some valuable substance to help another cell. So here are three examples of cooperation uh, that uh, have fascinated me ever since. On the very left, we can see a kind of cooperation as it was already in existence 3.5 billion years ago. These are bacteria, bacteria form filaments, and every so often a cell dies to feed the others with nitrogen. So here a bacterium cell gives its life in order to feed the others. And this was present already 3.5 billion years ago. Here is a kind of cooperation that came into existence 125 million years ago. These are social insects. These are workers that raise the offspring of another individual, the queen. Already Darwin noticed, why, why does this even exist? You know, how can natural selection lead to a perfectly designed individual that does not reproduce itself, but help another individual reproduce? And here's an example from our own time, only about 2,000 years ago. And this is Vincent van Gogh's famous painting of the Good Samaritan. Of course, people help each other. And here the Good Samaritan helps another person. The question is, why do people help each other if it is just natural selection? And in this book, Super Cooperator, I describe five mechanisms for the evolution of cooperation. I describe how natural selection can favor working together over competition. And these mechanisms are called direct reciprocity, indirect reciprocity, spatial selection, group selection, and kin selection. I point out maybe the first two. Direct reciprocity means our most important interactions are repeated. And in the context of a repeated interaction, cooperation can be a kind of winning strategy. Indirect reciprocity is most of our interactions occur in the context of reputation, where reputation matters. And when reputation matters, normally uh, cooperation is a winning strategy. It is fascinating to observe that cooperation is the master architect of the evolutionary process. Cooperation is involved whenever we have something truly new emerging in evolution. Cooperation is required for the emergence of the first cell, the first bacteria, the first higher cell, eukarya, complex multicellularity, insect societies, and people. So therefore, I have called cooperation the master architect of the evolutionary process. This is also really uh, radically changing the view of Darwinian evolution because it is not only fierce competition. It is not only natural selection. It is also cooperation. So a question that often emerges in evolutionary biology, especially in the discussion with uh, religion, is whether there's a tension between evolution and Christianity. And I also participated here in a program at Harvard with the Divinity School where we really discussed this question. And one tension that uh, comes about, for example, is the view of creationism. But creationism is not what I want to discuss uh, today, but instead, the biggest challenge that I see and that I experience in everyday life is actually scientific atheism. And scientific atheism is a kind of view uh, that is prevalent um, in Europe and in the US among people, and uh, where the statement would be that science offers all that is needed for understanding the world. Science suggests there is no God. Science shows that religious concepts are false. And the answer to this scientific atheism, in my opinion, and that is an answer that should be given broadly because people are oft very confused, uh, is the following, that scientists are actually often shallow in the God concept that they reject. So the God concept of Christianity is much more sophisticated than what is rejected by scientific atheists. I heard a professor, uh, uh, Peter Kreeft of Boston College recently, say very nicely, whenever I talk to a smart atheist, after about five minutes, I agree with him. I agree with him that I also do not believe in the God that he rejects, but it is not the God that we are talking about. The second reply to scientific atheism is really that scientific atheism itself is not science. This has to be clearly understood. It's not a scientific interpretation. It's not an interpretation of scientific theories. It's itself a metaphysical position. Scientific atheism for me is almost like an attempt to construct a religion of atheism. 
it is not science. It goes beyond the scientific interpretation. So the God, uh, I think that you would encounter in the major world religions uh, is much more sophisticated than what is rejected by atheistic scientists. And here the beautiful quotes of Moses Maimonides, 1135 to 1204, God is a faithless ocean of being from whom all things originate. Beside him, there is no second. Beyond him, there is no other. Or in the classical uh, Christian theology, God, uh, according to Augustine, is not an object in the universe. It's not caught in the flow of time, created the world ex nihilo. And these are very deep philosophical concepts. And uh, science does not really negate them in any way. And further on, God is a creator and a sustainer of the world. So not only a creator who sets things into motion in the beginning, but who has who is needed to keep the moment into existence. And also that without which there would be nothing at all. And I think this very much relates to the teachings of Thomas Aquinas. Um, and of course, you, you are the experts on this. So, in my opinion, evolutionary theory describes some laws of nature which God instantiates to unfold life. And this is the proper understanding of evolution. Without God, there would be no evolution, there would be no universe. And this is the God that we are talking about in classical Christian theology. And also I try to explain to people that evolution poses as little a problem for religion as gravity. So whenever religious people have a problem with the theory of evolution, you know, I would ask them, do you also have a problem with the theory of gravity? And most people don't have a problem with the theory of gravity. However, Darwin, uh, uh, Newton, when he first understood the mathematical workings of gravity, he did have a problem. And Newton made the famous remark here, hypothesis non finger. Even though I understand now mathematically what gravitation is, I do not make a hypothesis as to why there is gravitation. This is only up to God. So if you think of uh, uh, God and evolution, and if we firmly believe in the atemporal God outside the flow of time, it somehow seems necessary to actually hold the view that God lifts that entire trajectory of the world into existence. So instead of God setting things in the motion in the beginning and then lets it unfold according to some interplay of chance and necessity, um, the atemporal God, in my opinion, lifts the entire trajectory of the world into existence because has to will every individual moment into existence. And for me, this is the interpretation of Einstein's famous quote, God does not play dice. And so some of those ideas are described in the book uh, together with Sarah Coakley, Evolution, Games and God, uh, The Principle of Cooperation, published by Harvard University Press.